time. But ladies and gentlemen, please welcome four times Ironman World Champion, 13 Iron Distance Races, undefeated, Chrissy Wellington. getting here today. Sorry I'm a bit late. Uh, it's taken us two hours from Wimbledon, um, so I should have I should have run it. Um, but thanks so much um, for coming. Um, one thing that really annoys me when people talk is that they use these occasions to kind of pub, um, publicise their um, really, really awesome books that are on sale at the moment. Not these ones, um, but that one. Um, so just so you know, I'm doing a signing afterwards. There will be books, they will be on sale, um, and it will be at the, the book stand afterwards. Um, but that isn't really what I came to talk about um, to you today. Um, I came to give you um, one of these. No, it's not what you're thinking. It's not Valentine's Day anymore. Um, it's a silver bullet, because whenever people contact me, invariably they want some kind of secret to um, triathlon success. So I thought what I'd do is use this kind of 45 minute slot to go through some of the strategies for success, some of the strategies for becoming a champion. So hopefully there are some takeaway lessons I've learned through my career that you can apply to yours. Um, the first one is this. Um, in my view, you don't become a champion. You act like one. So yeah, I'm four-time I'm World War champion and it's a title that I hold. But it's the essence of, I guess, being a champion is the way in which you act each and every day. So hopefully you've all got goals and I'll come on to that in a minute. But in being a champion, um, you need to adopt certain strategies. The first one. You really, really have to know what it is that you're passionate about. And too many people bumble along in their lives not knowing what truly makes them happy. Not really thinking about it. And it might not be sport and it might not be triathlon, but you have to have a passion and you have to be prepared to follow it. Because if you're not prepared to follow it, you are never ever going to achieve your goal. Second, you have to take a chance and you have to be willing to set a goal and set a goal that scares you. And I remember when I um, won the World Age Group Championships and I, have to, I had to decide whether or not to become a professional athlete. Um, it was late 2006, early 2007. And I was so scared. I was so scared to give up my job, my job working um, in Westminster, give up my job and embark on this new career that I knew absolutely nothing about. I was scared that I wasn't going to be able to make a success out of it. I was scared about what people would think. And most importantly, I was scared of failure. I was scared of not achieving. And I think, especially in this country, there's this debilitating fear of failure that cripples many of us and stops us setting ambitious and new goals. But I guess I've always been guided by the philosophy that I've never ever wanted to look back and think, what if? I've never ever wanted to be left wondering what might, had been, might have been had I given 
something a chance. Um, and so when I was 30, I gave up my job and, as you know, became a professional athlete. But I guess what I'm trying to say is that all of us are scared at some point in our lives. All of us are scared of making a change and we're scared of standing on that cliff and, and jumping off. But you have to be prepared to take a chance. You have to be prepared to take a risk and to do something that's uncomfortable and step out of your comfort zone and set a new goal. Because in my mind, if you never try, you'll never know. And I look back at that time in 2006 and 2007 and I think, oh my God, what would I have become had I not had dared to take, uh, had I not have dared to take that, that path and become a professional athlete. And that's so scary to me. And it's a, a lesson that I've internalized and it's a lesson to me that I always need to take every single opportunity that comes across my path. So, you set a goal. Um, for me, my goal was to be a professional athlete and then subsequently it was to be um, an Ironman athlete. But I think you have to remember that it's a journey. It's part of a, a process. And if you're so wedded to the A goal without appreciating the small steps you've you've taken along the way you will never ever be satisfied because the proverbial happens and I'll talk about that later and there may be cases where you don't achieve your A goal and if you haven't celebrated the little steps that you've taken along the way it's going to be a really really unsatisfying journey because your whole sense of self and your sense of well-being is wedded to the achievement of that goal so you've got to see this whole process from a to whatever race you've chosen to do as um, as a journey setting a plan um, everyone that wants to be successful in whatever they've chosen needs a plan to get there so I just thought I'd talk a little bit about some of the key elements of a triathlon training plan I'm sure there'll be questions afterwards right the first thing to remember is that triathlon is one sport and not three and it sounds very simple but I'm constantly surprised by how many people compartmentalize what we do assuming a lot of us are triathletes here into swim bike and run and for example I get people contacting me and they say Chrissy I'm my run and I, I want to get faster on a marathon in an Ironman and I say well what's your position like on the bike what do you eat on the bike what equipment do you use on the bike and what's your swim bike and run uh, sorry swim and bike training like and they say no you don't understand I'm talking about my running and I say well so am I because the reason I was a relatively fast runner at Ironman distance was not necessarily because of the run training I was doing. I was a fast runner because of what I was doing, especially on the bike. And it's a really, really important point to remember. The other, I guess the other example I could use is um, the equipment, um, and specifically an aero helmet. So I'm often asked why I don't wear an aero helmet on the bike and the reason is that yes the aero helmet if I was in a wind tunnel um, conditions were perfect I might go five minutes faster over the Ironman distance fantastic but I also know that for me personally aero helmets make me really really hot I dissipate a lot of heat from my head so I overheat quite easily in my um, uh, in my head I go bright red, 
and um, aero helmets I find really, really claustrophobic. This doesn't really affect me on the bike necessarily. It would affect me at about 30k into the marathon when I'm overheating. And the reason you're dehydrated at 30k in, in the marathon is not necessarily what you've done on the marathon, it's what you've done on the bike. So you need to make the choices um, in training and racing, understanding that triathlon is, is one interconnected sport and not, and not three separate disciplines. The second aspect of a training plan is that it has to be individualized. It has to be tailored to you. It's very, it's very, very easy to pull a generic plan from a website. And if you're at the initial stages of your triathlon journey, then that's, that's generally okay. But if you want to improve and progress, you have to have a training plan that fits in with you and your life. We all have different strengths and weaknesses, and these evolve through our triathlon journey. We all have different lifestyles, we all have different jobs, we have family commitments. Unless you have a plan that fits in with you and your life, it's never going to be realistic and it's never going to be achievable. So, in terms of the plan, Um, the main sessions that it should include. In my mind, there are four. Um, the first one is the Easy staff conversational, unless you're in the swimming pool and it's quite hard, but conversational pace, um, bike and run. Nothing, um, nothing too strenuous. Your heart rate won't be elevated if you, if you use heart rate. Um, the second session is strength work. So in the swimming pool, we tend to use paddles, um, pool boy, and often we put um, an old inner tube around our ankles um, for extra drag. So that's strength work. So you might not be going particularly fast, but you're building strength, what we call strength endurance. On the run and on the bike, strength work is done mainly through hills. Um, so on the run, you want to pick a hill of between, well, it depends on what you're trying to achieve, but between 30 seconds and, and 90 seconds, um, depending on what stage you're at in your training, you could do, you know, 10 reps, you know, up to 15, even 20 reps, depending on the, on the length of the hill, gradient of about 5 or 6%. But hill work is amazing especially at this time of year for strength it teaches you great form because you've got to keep your hips high you've got to keep your turnover you've got to keep your you know your arms powering so hills are great on the run for for, um, for strength work also that use the downhills for recovery also great for building strength because you're building up the strength in your quads um, to deal with the impact of, of going downhill and similarly on the bike um, you could have a hill between five, anywhere between five and, you know, ten minutes. And if you have got aero bars, you could do that in the aero bars. You could push a slightly bigger gear, but it's great for, um, for building strength again. The third session is your race pace session. Um, and it's really, really important. I know a lot of you train with gadgets and, and monitors and, and things like that and that you use it to guide you. However, you must never lose the power of intuition. You all, assuming you all want to race, you all need to know what your race pace feels like without being beholden to um, a piece of technology. They, are, they have their place, they, they can be important, but first and foremost, you need to know what race pace feels like. You know, people ask me, how, how do you know how fast you run? How fast to run when you go on the marathon? I just know. I know because I've spent hours and days and weeks ingraining it into every fibre of my, my being. So, when you're practicing race pace, for example, in the swim, assuming 
that you're doing an Ironman, 3.8 kilometers. At some stage in your training, you want to do 3.8 kilometers, or maybe a little bit more, four kilometers, at race pace. But that can be broken down. So what we used to do was 40 times 100. So 40 times four lengths in a 25 meter pool. And we used to do it at race pace. So my race pace was one minute 20 per 100. So I used to do every single 100 on, on 120. Not 123, not 118. So I used to do 40 100s on 120. Bang, 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 bang. Off 125, so you meant I got five seconds rest every every time. But you can adapt that to suit you. To suit you. So if you're doing 100 in, in one minute 40, you could start off by doing 10 100s 145 trying to come in at 140 if that makes if that makes sense so adapt it to suit you but that's the way you can work out what your race pace is and ingrain it so you can you can feel it and on the bike and on the run you'll be doing tempo efforts you'll be doing longer time trials and you'll be able to feel what pace you can sustain for a certain um, certain duration but it's really really important that you practice that and you feel it and there were often times where I used to go out running and I, I'd, all, I'd cover up the pace um, uh, kind of monitor on, on my wrist and I'd try and guess what pace I'd be running. And slowly and slowly but surely you, you can work out what pace you're running and you can learn how to recognize that without the use of um, the monitor. How do you improve? your race pace so how do you get faster it's through the best session of all the one we all love it's interval sessions um, so called because you get um, a period of really really hard work when you want to vomit followed by a rest interval um, so there are two ways of, of doing kind of interval training you can make your hard interval harder or you can make your rest interval shorter. So there are two ways of, of, um, of doing it. So in the swim, it was a, we used to do a lot of uh, 25s and, and 50s, so they're you know, short but very, very hard. You can get quite a bit more rest than you do on the race pace work. And again, on, on the bike, you could be doing you know, two, three, five minute hard efforts, but with a longer, a longer recovery and the same on, on the run we used to do um, quite a lot of 400 and 800 meter reps um, on the track or you can even do it on the on the treadmill which is great for for leg turnover so if you can incorporate those sessions into for example a, a 10 day cycle you'll not only be able to develop kind of strength endurance but you'd also be able to develop speed and and slowly progress um, people talk a lot about periodization um, and by which I think they mean um, dedicating certain parts of your season to developing certain aspects of your physiology so many people um, over the winter do a lot of base mileage so a lot of the the first and the second um, type of session the steady stuff and the strength stuff and then as the season progresses um, build in race pace and, and intervals I'd say it's not so simple and I think much depends on your background and um, your strengths and your weaknesses. If you're coming from a non-sporting, non-endurance background, there definitely is value for um, in building in building a base. You can't go straight into doing hard, intense intervals. However, if you've got years and years of endurance under your belt, you can start 
that in those intervals very, uh, much earlier on in the season. And in fact, we introduced interval training almost immediately after my um, off season, which was also always in, in November and December. So periodization, there's no hard and fast rule and it much depends on your strengths and weaknesses. And um, for example, if you are a, um, a relatively weaker swimmer, you might want to spend the winter, especially when it's um, torrid weather outside, getting a lot more swim mileage in because that's your weakest discipline. So it is very, very individualized. Um, I did put out a tweet a few weeks ago, about, or last week actually, about what people might want to hear about. And someone asked me to talk about um, juggling balls. Um, they didn't ask for that specifically, but I thought because it was Valentine's Day, I'd continue the innuendos. Um, so juggling balls, as I've put here, is part of the challenge. Triathlon is, and sport generally, if you're training for a marathon, you're training for any event, it's stressful. It's demanding, but that is part of the challenge. You always want, the training and racing to be what I've called a good stress rather than a bad stress and yes it can be really really difficult as an amateur athlete working um, for the government I was training around 20 to 25 hours a week on top of my full-time job and my um, my social life I didn't have um, family um, or husband at that time so I didn't have that extra ball to juggle so to speak but there was definitely a case of needing effective time management and organization and prioritization um, so how do you fit triathlon around or sport generally around um, every other area of your life and every other commitment that you have the first one, as I mentioned before, you have to have a plan that fits in with your lifestyle. There is no point in following your friend's plan if your friend doesn't have kids, doesn't have a husband, and, and doesn't work full time um, with a huge, horrendous commute. You've got to have a plan that fits in with you, because otherwise you're going to set targets, you're going to say, I want to do a swim here, and a run here, and a bike here, and then life is going to get in the way. And then you're going to get really stressed and really peed off um, that you haven't been able to tick that box. Well, that's because your plan wasn't realistic in the first place. So take a good, hard look at, at, at your week or at your month and look at it in terms of priority slots and non-priority slots. Um, so you've got sessions that you really, really need to do. They're the priority sessions and they always go in the slots that you have available in the week. And the other ones are nice to have and that you can lose if you absolutely have to. And you have to know what sessions are the priority sessions and what sessions are not. And I can't, uh, I can't tell you what those are because I don't know you all as, as individuals, but you do need to put those in the slots that you have, sorry, priority sessions, and make sure you put those in the slots that you have available. And then be prepared to forgo the ones that are the nice to have. Um, it's always important to remember that quality trumps quantity every single time. And there's this emphasis, especially in triathlon, um, about doing kilometers or miles. If I had a pound, time someone asked me how many hours a week I trained or how many miles I did on the bike or how many k's in the pool or miles on the run I would be a gazillionaire and I can go shopping here to my heart's content it doesn't matter it doesn't matter how many hours you do a week it doesn't matter how many miles you do tell me how hard you worked that's what's important 
Jordan. It doesn't matter if you're doing 20 hours or 25 hours, because those extra five hours could be total and utter junk. And not only could they be junk, but they could be undermining the 20 hours of good work that you've done. And I'll come on to that in a minute. So you've always, if time is limited, you've always got to go for your band for buck sessions. So people complain about having to go on the turbo home trainer. The, the turbo is tedious. It can be very, very tedious and horrible and sweaty and smelly. It gives you bang for buck because there is no freewheeling at all. No freewheeling like you have on the road. So you could, if you've got a two hour road ride scheduled, you could get on the turbo for 45 minutes or an hour and get the same benefit. Because you, you're, the, the intensity that you work out on the turbo is so very, very different from, from the road. Also, you could be better off doing a 30 minute run with 15 minutes worth of, of effort than going out for an hour steady. You get much more, you can get much more benefit from that, that session. If you want a great, um, uh, or le sorry, least time intensive, amazing interval run session, look up the Monaghetti set. The Monaghetti set is awesome and it's about 20 minutes of, of effort in about a 30 minute, 30 minute run, 35 minute run, but it's awesome. It's like 15 minutes, 15 seconds on, 15 seconds off, 30 seconds on, 30 seconds off, one minute on, one minute off. And um, it's like a pyramid, but it's amazing. Um, but there are some great um, short, sharp interval sessions that can really give you bang for buck. Um, limit faff. We all faff at some point. You know, we want to go for a run, but it's raining, and so we spend 15 minutes deciding what colour compression socks we might want to wear, because that really, really matters. And at that point, you've only got 20 minutes, and then you get really frustrated that you've only done 20 minute run. So limit the faff, have your clothes at work if you want to run at work, have your shoes by the door, have the laces undone so you haven't got to spend hours because you only kicked them off the night before and you didn't untie your laces. Just have everything ready as much as you can. Also goes for nutrition, and I'll talk about that in a second. Key element of training, have food ready so when you get in, you haven't got to prepare as much. So have cook large batches of, of, of meals, or Mar Marks and Spencer's do a very fine range um, as well. But just have some, some food ready and available for when you finish training, because you're probably going to be finished training after work when it's nine o'clock and you really don't want to spend half an hour cooking. And likewise with like easily transportable snacks, make sure you have loads of those for, um, for uh, when you're on your commute or, you know, on a train traveling somewhere, you just need um, snacks that are go-to um, rather than having to spend time shopping for something. Um, multitasking goes without saying. Um, I always used to do a lot of my cycling to and from work. It was whatever it was, half an hour to and from work, but that's an hour that's an hour of biking. It's not always um, easy, especially if you've got children, you've got to take children to school or whatever, but try and, and incorporate the sessions into your life as much as you can. And the same goes for strength and conditioning. You know, I used to do, as a professional, I used to do three hour conditioning, three one hour strength and conditioning sessions a week. You guys don't have that luxury. You don't. So just when you're brushing your teeth, think about brushing your teeth with your eyes closed, standing on, on one leg, or doing the washing up if you haven't got dishwashers, you know, doing single leg squats. So there are ways in which you can incorporate strength work into your life. Um, and the last one is, I think it's really important. Um, either, you sh well, 
I would encourage you all to share that journey with your loved ones. If you don't have the buy-in of your loved ones, it's really, really difficult to achieve your goal. And I know that Crowy used to get his family, sorry, Craig Alexander used to get his family to set up aid stations on the run. So his long run became this huge family adventure. And that was way of, you know, his way of incorporating his family into his, his training. Um, I assume that a lot of us, a lot of you guys are like me. Um, A-type personalities, hate not completing a session, hate not doing a session, beat yourself up if you don't go on a run when you've said, when you've said you will. That's, that's natural and you're only human. But it's not the end of the world. It's not the end of the world if you miss a race. It's not the end of the world if you miss a session. It's not going to set you back. So just accept it as your reality and move on rather than beating yourself up over what you haven't done. Um, in my mind, training though is um, a bit like baking a cake. So you have the swim, bike and run, but you have everything else besides. And it's often the everything else besides that makes the difference. So people have their logbooks, they have these great logbooks, columns, swim, bike, run, maybe a little one for strength and conditioning if you brush your teeth standing on one leg and close your eyes. And that's it. So nowhere in their logbooks do they say how much sleep they've got. Nowhere do they talk about their massage or what they've, you know, eaten or, or drunk in the week. These are all the marginal gains that you might have heard Dave Railsford talk about in relation to um, Team Sky and, and British Cycling. The minutiae, the other important pillars of training. And I truly believe that it's not necessarily the best swim bike runners in the world that are going to win a race. It's not that that is going to make you into a champion and enable you to achieve your goal. It's getting a handle on some of these things. Um, especially the second one. I used to hate resting. I used to hate it. For me, it was tantamount to weakness. Having a day off was like saying, I've, I've given up. And I used to beat myself up over it. And in 2007, when I was contemplating becoming a professional, I went to see the guy that was to become my coach, Brett Sutton. And he said to me, Chrissy, You've got what it takes physically to become a champion, but I'm gonna have to chop your head off. And it was a slightly, I guess, macabre way of telling me that I had a whole heap of work to do up here. Yeah, I could swim and I could bike and I could run, but my head was all over the place. I obsessed, I analysed, overanalyzed everything, I stressed if I had a bad session, I stressed even more if I had a bad race, I stressed if people were beating me that I didn't think should beat me, and I couldn't relax. I couldn't take time off. So when you're a professional athlete, you've got four or six hours a day of training, which gives you about 18 hours of putting your feet up. I couldn't do it. I'd have to go walking around, I'd you know, go shopping, go and visit places. I'd, we were in Switzerland, I'd want to climb a mountain. And what he made me realise was that it wasn't the swim, bike and run at all that was going to make me into a champion. It was the ability to rest and recover. Because when you, when you train, you stress your body. You break down the muscle fibres, essentially. And you cannot build them up unless you rest. So, as a 
professional athlete, like I said, 18 hours of my day was spent resting and recovering. You guys do not have that luxury, I assume. So take a rest day. Take a rest day once every seven to 10 days. It's okay. And it's gonna make you stronger. It's really, really important. Um, and the other aspect of rest and recovery in the bigger picture is the off season. So you always, always should have an off season. Um, which for me was about six weeks in duration from Ironman World Championships in October. Six weeks of off season. Not just to recharge myself physically, but to recharge myself mentally. Because if you're always thinking about triathlon, if you're always thinking about fitting in training around other areas of your life, it's very, very demanding. And for a couple of seasons, it's okay. But in the long term, it's gonna crush you. Because you've gotta take time out. You've gotta recharge your batteries. Um, it's really, really important to remember that you guys, I think the majority of you are amateur athletes. Um, you're not professional athletes. And so what we do as professionals in training as much as you know, we did and getting as much rest as we did, it's just not, it's not practical for you. So make sure that your rest, your recovery, and your training, as I said before, um, is tailored to you and, and your life. Um, the other important aspect of, um, of training, and I think people are starting to realize that, even you know, looking back 20 or 30 years, chatting to my coach, Dave Scott, him telling me that he survived in an Iron Man on figs and cottage cheese um, makes me realise quite how far um, we've come in some respects. Um, I, I feel that in many ways we've swung the other way and we've gone too far into um, the overconsumption of quote unquote sports nutrition products without realizing that sports nutrition really is about what you eat on your in your day to day life. Um, I don't think I've got enough time to go into what a daily diet should look like so I just thought I'd put up um, what my race day nutrition was um, at Ironman distance. Um, I'd have um, what we call, it's called cream of rice. Um, you buy it in the States, but you can buy it actually here uh, in the baby department um, of all good shops. Um, it's kind of finely granulated rice. Um, and you just add boiling water and it's cooked. It's awesome, especially for people like me that aren't very good at cooking. Um, and then I added peanut butter or tahini, sesame seed paste for um, fat, a bit of protein, honey and half a banana um, and a cup of coffee. Don't have the coffee if you don't normally have coffee um, because it comes back to bite you later on on the run, generally. Um, but I'd have that about two, two and a quarter hours before the start. Bearing in mind that Ironmans tend to start at the crack it meant getting up at about 3.45, 4 o'clock to have my breakfast, um, you know, two hours, two and a quarter hours before the start. Then I didn't have anything until I got onto the bike. Two bottles of energy drink, chocolate bar, which I ate one bite of every hour, and um, two gels. And then on the run, six gels once, one every 25 minutes. Um, that worked out at, well, it sounds complicated, but it's not. It's one gram of carbs per kilo of body weight per hour. So I used to race around 60 kilos, so 60 grams of carbs an hour. 
Obviously I'm racing at a, a, an intensity that, and a, for a duration that might be different to many of you. And that has to be factored into um, uh, your, your race nutrition. But the important thing to remember is that this needs to be, this needs to be practiced. You don't need to take on board energy drink and gels every single session. But in some sessions you do need to practice what you're going to use on race day. Not only in terms of what sits well with you, um, but also in terms of what's palatable. And through trial and error um, and practice, eventually making perfect, I worked out what flavours of gels I like, not only what gel, what brand of gel I liked. Um, so I knew that on the bike, I quite liked a chocolate gel and vanilla bean, but I didn't like those on the run. They tasted horrible to me. But I only found that out through, um, through trial and error. So it's really, really important um, that you practice in, in some training sessions, but also that you appreciate that racing is also a means of practicing what you need to do. There's, in my mind, it's very, very rare to get a perfect race. I was always learning and always evolving. And it took me six Ironmans out of my 13s to 13 to develop a strategy that I found actually worked for me. Another really, really important element of training that's overlooked and probably isn't in any of your logbooks is about training the brain. And why? Because we're not all built like Mr. Motivator. Do you remember Mr. Motivator? I'm like, that's good. I was Googling for this picture, actually. And do you know you can buy a Mr. Motivator outfit for fancy dress parties? So if you're ever stuck for a 1980s icon to go as for a, um, for a fancy dress party, you can indeed buy a Mr. Motivator outfit very similar to that. Um, but actually triathletes did look like that, didn't they, in the 1980s. John Lum, I don't know if you know John Lum, but he probably wore something very, very similar to that um, with the handlebar moustache. Anyway, um, why is training the brain so important? For many reasons, um, I just thought I'd give two. This is the first one, because motivation and flows and I often get asked how do you motivate yourself and I think people assume that professional athletes are born with this amazingly amazingly high level of, of motivation and it's not always the case we struggle like everyone else to motivate ourselves at certain points motivation ebbs and flows um, it's really annoying when people give presentations and they go through them all, but hopefully you can read a lot of these. But realistic goals, really important. If you've set goals that are not realistic, then you're going to beat yourself up because you're not able to achieve them, whether that's in your training plan or, or your race goals. So your goals have got to be realistic. In terms of motivating yourself when you really don't want to get out of the door, you really don't want to do that session. Remember why you set the goal in the first place. So remember what your goal is. I want to do an Ironman. But that's not enough. You've got to remember why you want it. And that's your motive. So why do you want it? Do you want it because your best friend dared you? Do you want it because it was a drunken bet? Do you want it because you want to raise money for a loved one? Do you want to race in memory of someone? Do you want to raise money for a cause? Do you want it to do it just because you want to challenge yourself? Know deep down why you want it and make that tangible. Everywhere in my house I had little post-it notes about related to my goal and, 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 why, and why I want it. Again, this goes with the juggling balls thing, but make training accessible and practical. 
if you if you've got to cycle home, get all your clothes together, um, try and find the trainers, find a, a gel in, in in the cupboard. You're gonna your motivation would have waned by the time all that's finished. So make sure your trainers training um, and training venues are as, as accessible um, as they can be. Take the first step. The, getting out of the door is the hardest thing of all for all of us. If you've got an hour run to do, just play mind tricks with yourself and just say, I'll run for two minutes, I'll run for five minutes. And then when you've done that five minutes, it is easy to carry on. So you've just got to do that, take that first step. When I was doing the 4100s, it wasn't a session that I ever relished. So I got in thinking, I'm going to do five 100s. Oh, I've done five, I'll get up to 10. Oh, I'll get up to 20. And then you think, awesome, I'm halfway. So you don't get in thinking I've got to do 40 100s. Um, inspirational videos, um, for me it was a lot of kind of Kona reruns, um, music, I had a Kona playlist that um, uh, always kicked me up the backside, poems, Rudyard Kipling's If was always a favourite and I have a dogged copy. Um, reading about people that have overcome adversity and struggled always helps me. Um, not because I want to, um, or not to relish the misfortune of others, but just because it makes me realise that if they've gone through something, I can too. Um, it's always motivational, more motivational to train with other people. If you've promised your best friend or your husband or your colleague that you're going to go out for a run, you can't leave them standing in the rain. But you can't train with people all of the time and I'll come on to that in a minute. Um, you've always got to remember times where you haven't wanted to get out of the door and you managed to force yourself and you did that hour run and you came back and it was amazing and you felt so good afterwards. Bank that and remember it and remember when you don't want to go again you think, oh, I didn't want to go last time, but I, I did it, and afterwards I felt so good. And it will kick your backside out, out of the door. Um, the last one, it's, as I said, it's natural to have ebb and flow of motivation. You might want to accept that the goal is not right for you. If you're struggling over weeks and months to really get excited about training, it could be indicative of A, you're overtrained and that you need to take steps to address that, or B, that the goal isn't right for you and you're not doing you're not doing an Ironman because you want to, you're doing it because you thought that you ought to. So you've also got to read into that um, declining motor, uh, 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 sorry, a long-term decline in motivation and take steps to address that. The second reason training the mind is so important is because endurance sports are about enduring. And in my mind, that means enduring discomfort. And no matter how fit you are, training and racing hurt. They hurt. And if they don't, you're not doing it hard enough. Um, so you have to develop mental strategies to be able to deal with that discomfort. And the good thing is, there are strategies and there are tools that you can learn and that you can um, that you can hope. The first one sounds oxymoronic, but train alone. You race alone. In an Ironman, I have to be in my own head for nine hours. If I do every single session with other people and rely on them for my motivation, how in the hell are you going to motivate yourself when you're alone in your own head for nine hours? It's really difficult. So you have to spend some time training alone and battling some of those demons and learning how to deal with them. Again, remembering your goals and motives. Positive visualization. I always used to visualize before a race. I used to lie down, 
somewhere really peaceful and visualise myself as being strong and successful, as winning the race. But then I always used to visualise, also used to visualise um, things going wrong. Um, and it sounds pessimistic, but things will go wrong in a race. Your goggles will get knocked off, you'll get a flat tyre, you'll get a cramp. How are you going to deal with them? So you run through that in your mind so that you know how you're going to deal with it when it happens. And that gives you the peace of mind that when it does happen, you've already um, encountered and dealt with it. Positive words and affirmations. Um, I hope a lot of you have, or all of you have, a mantra that you can repeat kind of ad infinitum. Mine was never ever give up and smile and I used to write it everywhere on my race wristbands, on my water bottle, on my screensaver and I used to repeat it over and over again. Um, break the session and race down into smaller manageable segments as I alluded to before. If it's really hurting when you get onto the marathon, the last thing you want to think is I've got to run a marathon. So you just break it down. For me, the marathon in an Ironman was always four lots of 10K and then a little bit of change. I never thought I was doing 42K. I thought I was doing 10K. And it could be even smaller segments. It can be to your friends and family who are going to be cheering on the sidelines. It can be the next aid station. It can be the next kilometer marker. But once you get there, as long as you keep moving forward, you're always going to get to the finish line. The last one, if you want to learn to hurt, or learn to, sorry, learn to endure in, in racing, you have to learn to hurt in training. So you have to do the sessions that are uncomfortable, the sessions that you might not think you can. It's, it's not kind of gratuitous masochism, you can't just flog yourself every single session, but you've got to have sessions where you go out the door thinking, oh, I don't know if I'm going to be able to do this, and there are some instances where you might not be able to hit your times, but there, there will be sessions where you achieve those goals and you bank those memories, and when it hurts in races, you remember those times that you've overcome pain. Because guess what? It doesn't go perfectly. The perfect race is the one where you overcome imperfections perfectly. There will be things that go wrong. Every single Iron Man I did, something went wrong, quote unquote. I didn't feel good at certain points, or I lost my nutrition, or I got a flat tire, or I ended up in the bushes. Things happen. That's racing. That's the beauty of racing. Perfection is boring, and it's not going to happen anyway. So you need to learn to deal with it, and that's why you need a mind that's as powerful as your butt cheeks and I think we've all got examples of when this is of when we've needed that that, that mental strength and this is the one that I guess is at the fore of my mind um, because I got through this not on physical strength but on mental fortitude and um, as many of you know two weeks before Kona in 2011 I came off my off my bike and I spent much of the next two weeks in hospital and getting all that scrubbed out and bandaged so I, I could hardly train and I remember actually getting in the swimming pool about five days after and I got in the swimming pool, Dave Scott was there and my boyfriend Tom and I swam a length and they were on the other end and I couldn't even manage to get back um, um, Sorry, so do, do the other 25 and get back to where they were because my leg was hurting so much and they had to pick me out of the pool and carry me like a baby back to the car and that was eight days before Kona. And I was riddled with self-doubt. So I used all the strategies that I alluded to earlier. The visualisation, the recalling your goal. 
I read Sir Steve Redgrave's book, which is absolutely amazing, um, called Inspired. Um, and it talks about how he's overcome, he overcame so much adversity to get to where he wanted to, to be and, and, and achieved his five, five gold um, Olympic medals. And I thought, if he can do it, then so can I. Um, and that was the race that I always wanted. Not because everything went perfectly, it was absolutely horrific. But it was perfection in terms of the way I overcame the imperfections. Um, and this was the race of my dreams. It was the race that I always craved within myself, where I fought tooth and nail and crossed that finish line absolutely annihilated, which is all I ever wanted. And the race with my competitors, where I came from 20, 22 minutes back to fight and battle them to um, be crowned Ironman World Champion. And what I realised then was that I was capable of so much more than I thought I was. Not because of my physical training, but the mental strength that um, I was able to, to use and, and deploy. Um, just to finish off, um, I wanted to talk about the last characteristic, I guess, of, of a champion. Um, and this is JJ, um, or Joshua, and the first thing that JJ said to me when I met him was, Chrissy, do you want to race? champion and he didn't care that he was three and he didn't care that he didn't have any legs in JJ's mind there were no limits to what he could achieve and I'm sure many of you have children and what amazes me about children is that they have no sense of fear they have no to what is possible you know it's very reasonable for them to say I want to be an astronaut or I want to be this or I want to run this they have no concept of, of limits but at some stage as we get older people start saying that nah, can't do that no that's not possible you know you're not fit enough to do that or you're not you know you're not capable enough to do this or that's gonna that's gonna hurt too much or you can't do it because you're a woman. The most important characteristic that anyone could have, in my mind, is the belief that there are no limits to what they can achieve. And it might not take you to the top of the world, but there is absolutely no reason why you can't set ambitious goals to take a chance to look fear in the face and truly believe that you can achieve more than you ever thought possible. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Christian.